Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to be here. Uh, we're going to do our announcements at this time. Um, and so um, as we go into our announcements, we want to remind everyone to please silence your cell phone or turn them off. Uh, so if you can please silence or turn them off. Uh, we want to say welcome to our visitors, let you know that you are indeed our honored guest, and that we're glad that you come with us, come out to worship with us today in spirit and in truth. We pray that we will say something that will edify you. Uh, however we say something that you have a question, uh, please feel free to ask us any Bible question. We will give you a Bible answer for your Bible question. I, I do have one visitor's card, and it's a Jacqueline Cawthorn? Kachita. Okay, Kachita. Yeah, and um, she is a walk-in. Uh, she goes to Grace Unlimited International Church, and she's visiting. So we want to just say welcome, and uh, uh, we're glad that you are here with us today. Okay? And uh, as we go into our announcements, uh, we have some uh, good news over here. Brother uh, Daryl relayed to us last week uh, that Sister Paula, we know she's been on hospice for a very long time. She's been on so long that the doctors are now convinced she, they took her off of hospice. <laughs> so that's a good note that, uh, you know, once again, uh, that uh, God has blessed her, and we will pray that her strength will get up, that she'll maybe be able to come out and to uh, worship with us. Um, here at the congregation. Uh, we also had a new birth uh, last week, and uh, uh, we all know her as Shawnee, uh, uh, but uh, Shawnee Bradley, and so let us uh, uh, embrace her and encourage her as she starts off her Christian walk. Um, the, in here we have uh, uh, some things of uh, uh, scripture memory verse for us, and we have our daily Bible readings. Uh, for those, but as we go into our prayer requests, um, we want to be mindful. We found out last week, Brother Christian Abali, uh, that his grandmother passed. And so let us keep him in prayer uh, and let us keep his family in prayer. Uh, I'm requesting a prayer for a co worker of mine uh, who uh, just found out uh, his, she's about to turn 13, but she found out she got leukemia. And so for right now, she's going to be spending the next 63 days just going through treatment and everything in Children's Hospital. And so pray that, uh, you know, um, listen to him. He said leukemia is something that never goes away. Amen. It goes in submission, but you, you don't get rid of it. And so let's pray that when they're done that it will be in submission for her. Uh, I also have uh, my siblings, uh, Douglas, Alvin, and his family, and... Uh, Carmen and Renee, they will be traveling, uh, so pray that they have a, a safe trip back from Texas. Um, there was a brother, Roy Williams, uh, up north. His wife passed, and so we want to keep uh, Brother Williams in prayer. And uh, Sister Maria had uh, requested prayers for Adrian, uh, who tested positive for COVID, so we want to keep her in prayer. We always want to be mindful of our sick and shut-in. We know Brother Tariq is still out uh, for his uh, knee surgery. Uh, last week, Brother Gerald Evans was here, so it was good to see him. And we have, as I said, Sister uh, Paula. Um, inside here, just some things that are going around uh, the Brotherhood. Uh, if we look at that, uh, yesterday was a kickoff of the 2022 Metroplex uh, Bible Teacher Workshop. And, and they were focusing on, you know, with the pandemic and people coming to church and things like this, trying to encourage people. And so it will be continuing. Uh, I, I think they're going to have some today, some Monday, and some Tuesday. So the 31st will be the last day. Uh, but they will post it up on YouTube if you want to go back and look at that later. The flyers are in the foyer if you want to. Uh, but if you want to look at it, um, I can send you the link if you're interested in that. Um, we also are having our uh, annual wide picnic, which is coming up on June 18th. And uh, there's a, a Ladies' Day uh, that's been hosted by the uh, Las Vegas uh, Church of Christ, uh, which is going to be June 25th. 
I'm pretty sure that this will be virtual, but if some of you wanted to go up there and attend that, that's something that you can do also. And they're having the seventh annual Sound Doctrine Summit, uh, which is going to be held in uh, Arkansas, if you're interested in that. Uh, the early registration has already passed, uh, but this is more or less almost similar to like a lectureship. Uh, and then we have the Bible camp that Bostonia puts on every year. And so uh, I don't have any other uh, announcement, but uh, please avail yourself of a bulletin um, so that you may uh, be, uh, you know, like you said, there's some other activities, some other readings and things uh, that are uh, in there. I do know in our class today we talked about the gospel minutes, uh, the gospel minutes uh, that is out in the back that the church uh, provides. Uh, they talk about various topics. And they're good things for us in our Christian growth. So I encourage everyone to, you know, pick one up. There, there's quite a few out there. Pick them up, go home, read them. So, uh, uh, so once again, you know, maybe there's a topic or a subject that you're interested in or want to know more about. Uh, and so that's why that material is out there for you. Uh, I, I don't have anything else to say. So at this time, I will uh, turn the service over to uh, Brother Mark to lead us in our opening prayer. Let us all go to God in prayer. Dear God in heaven, it is again, we're before you, thanking you, dear God, for watching over us last night and allowing us to wake up to see another day. And to never, ever forget that so many have gone on to eternity since last Sunday this time. Even people I've always loved and admired so much, dear God, they're gone. And it reminds me of the mere fact that I don't want to leave this world in an undone condition, because if you do, you're going to wind up somewhere else. Bless the sick in the church. Pray that Sister Paula, she's a tough old trooper, continue to bless Sister Paula. Give her strength and restore her to a normal portion of health and strength. Have mercy on all the sick in the church, dear God. Please have mercy. Watch over Brother Darrell that's going to come before us short and break on us the bread of life. Grant him a great recollection of things he studied. That he may bring you unsearchable riches to us so plain a little child can understand it. When he's finished with his sermon, I pray that some poor soul will come crying, Lord, what must I do to be saved? Dear God, before I close this prayer, please forgive me for my shortcomings, whatever sins I may have committed, knowingly or non unknowingly. And one of the main problems we all men have, dear God, is be careful what you say and how you treat your wife because a lot of times we're wrong and we don't listen to our wives. But give us five shortcomings and give us strength where we're weak in certain areas. Continue to guide God and direct us in the path you want us to go. Forgive me, dear God, and I pray that with the end of the Father that he service, that you'll be with this young man, the song leader, be with him, and grant him a great recollection, great recollection of things he's studied, and he may bring your songs and hymns to the church so plain a little child can understand what this young man is singing about. Now be with us, dear God, and continue to guide God direct us in the path you want us to go. And when we've done all we can do upon this old sin curse, so we can't do anymore, have mercy while mercy can still be found, dear God, and grant us a home in that up and better kingdom. I'm asking it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. All right, this morning, we're going to start in the blue books, um, page 12. I woke up this morning. Give y'all a chance to get the blue books out. <laughs> there we go. All right. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Well, I woke up this morning with my mind, and you know it will stay on the Lord. Well, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus, singing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I'm singing and praying with my mind Stayed on Jesus Well, I'm singing and praying with my mind 
stayed on the lower line, singing and praying with my mind. Stayed on Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, we're going to go to page nine, page nine. We've got to get feeling good this morning. There we go. Uh, I keep falling in love with him. I keep falling in love with him. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Savior and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He keeps blessing me over and over and over and over and over again. He keeps blessing me over and over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter, sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He keeps cleansing me over and over and over and over and over again. He keeps cleansing me over and over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. All right. And the last one before communion, we're going to go to page 25. Page 25 before communion. Because he lives. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died to buy my part. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives Because he lives, I can face tomorrow because he lives, all fear is gone, all fear is gone, because I know he holds the future. Because he lives, and then one day I'll cross the river, 
church say amen. amen we come to a very important part of our service where we're commanded to do communion in, in the remembrance of our lord and savior jesus christ with this in mind i will be reading from first corinthians chapter 11 beginning at verse 23 and the bible reads for i received of the lord that which also i deliver unto you that the lord jesus the same night which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me we we'll ask Brother Keith to say a prayer for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we'd just like to thank you for this time that you have brought us here, this part of the program. My Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless this time. Bless this communion, my Heavenly Father, which our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ showed us how to do, participate in. Let him be the bread of life for all of us. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. 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 The Bible goes and reading says, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is New Testament, my blood. This do ye off as ye drink it, and remember to me. We ask Brother Mark to say a prayer for the cup. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this blood that represents your son. I'm sorry. Dear Lord, we thank you for this fruit of the vine which represents your, your son's blood that he shed on the cross for our sins, Heavenly Father. We pray that as we partake of it, that we reflect on the cross, dear Lord, and remember what he did for all of us. In Jesus Christ's name, we give thanks and praise. Amen. Amen. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak, and sickly among you, and many sleep. Let's commune at this time. Psalms 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of ungodly, nor strength in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaves also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doth shall, he doth shall prosper. The godly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. 
Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of righteousness. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands as under and cast away their cords from us. Did we miss anyone? That concludes this part of our service. We come to another part of our service where we're commanded to give back to the Lord. With this in mind, I will be reading from First, first Corinthians, no, my, sorry about that. Second Corinthians chapter nine, beginning at verse six. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly, sparingly should reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully should reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have an all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. With this in mind, let us give. Turning your regular hymn books to page 875, Home of the Soul. If for the price we have striven, after our labors are all, rest to our souls will be given. On that eternal shore, and we're singing, home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest, never to roam, we are free from our care, happy and bright, Jesus is there, he is the light of in the storm, lonely are we. Sighing for home, longing for thee is the beautiful home of the ransom beside the Christmas. Let us pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, as we approach your throne of grace, mercy, peace, and love, Father. We're just so thankful, Father, once again for giving us the opportunity, Father, to assemble here to worship you in spirit and in truth, Father. Father, as we take time, Father, to give back a small portion that you bless us with, Father, we just ask, Father, that you bless it, Father, and bless those who are able to give at this time, and bless those who are not able to give at this time, that they may be able to give at the next appointed time, Father. We thank you, Father, and we love you. For in Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks. Amen. Amen. Let's go to verse 2. Yes, a sweet rest is remaining for the true children of God, where there will be no complaining, never a chastening while we're singing, home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest. Never to roam, we are free from our care, happy and bright. Jesus is there, he is the light up in the storm. Lonely are we, we are sighing for home. Longing for thee is the beautiful home of the world. Some beside the crystal sea, crystal sea. Soon a bright homeland adorning. We shall behold the glad dawn. Lean on the Lord till the morning. 
trust till the night is gone. Home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest, never to worry, we are free from our care, happy and bright, Jesus is there, he is the light, off in the storm, lonely are we, we are sighing for home. Longing for thee is the beautiful home of the ransom beside the crystal sea, crystal sea. Amen. All right, so the song that's going to be after the, uh, after the sermon is going to be page 67 back in the blue book. So you can just go ahead and mark that. It'll be 67 in the blue book. And let us go ahead and stand. All right. How you guys feeling this morning? Okay, there we go. I see some smiles coming in. <laughs> All right, we're going to sing uh, Still Have Joy uh, to go ahead and start before the sermon. I don't think that was that in the book. I don't think it was. Fo just follow me. Follow me. We're, we're, gonna, we're just going to go. So you're just going to repeat after me. All right, we sang it before. Y'all got it the first time. <laughs> Still have joy, you know I still have joy. After all the things I've been through, I still have joy. Sing it over, I still have joy. I still have joy. After all the things I've been through, Lord, I still have joy. Keep it over, I still have joy. You know I still have joy. And after all the things I've been through, y'all, I still have Still have love, still have love. You know I still have love. And after all the things I've been through, y'all, I still have, still have peace. Still have peace, y'all, still have peace. And after all the things I've been through, Lord, I still have Still have hope, still have hope. You know I still have hope. After all the things I've been through, Lord, I still have. Still have faith, still have faith. You know I still have faith. And after all the things I've been through, y'all, I still have Still have love, still have love. You know I still have love. And after all the things I've been through, y'all, I still have love. Sing it over, I still have love. You know I still have love. And after all the things I've been through, y'all, I still have, still have joy, still have joy. You know I still have joy. And after all the things I've been through, y'all, I still have joy. Keep it going, I still have joy. You know I still have joy. After all the things I've been through, Lord, I still have joy. I still have joy. I still have joy. After all the things I've been through, Lord, I still have joy. Amen. Good morning, church. Amen. Brother Javon, God bless you, brother. I was chatting to him the last time he was here. I said, I was singing that song for about two weeks. About two weeks. It's a beautiful song. That might become the new alma mater. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Thank you, brother, for that wonderful uh, song. And thank you all for coming on out and uh, celebrating with us our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's time for us to set aside our cares and our problems and our troubles and our struggles and begin to focus on the Lord. 
and take a little time and just think about him and what he's done for us and what he continues to do for us. We know that there's a time of heavy grieving, heavy mourning right now with the shootings that we had in New York and then another one that we had just recently down in, uh, in Texas. And not just those places, but all of them that have been just plaguing our society of late. It's time for us to turn our attention to the Lord. And it's time for us to once again begin to work with our children, teach our children, not that we aren't, but obviously we have to step up our game. We have to uh, uh, press a little bit harder uh, because we just see how crazy uh, this society is. We want to welcome all of our visitors. If you're visiting here with us at the East Palomar Street Church of Christ, you are honored guests. We have a few people that are out that are traveling on this morning, uh, but we welcome you. We honor you and you are here. We love you and God bless you so much. We're going through a series of lessons and I don't know, Brother Dave, if I'm going to be able to finish this today. I'm going to do the best I can. I'll try to be respectful of all of our times, knowing that, you know, this is the day that is set aside for the Lord. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to be like Paul and preach till midnight. We want to be respectful of your time, but uh, we are going through a series of lessons right now that really has uh, touched my heart. I have not preached through this uh, book and as I've been studying and reading, it's just caused me to slow down a little bit and want all of us to really gather uh, what God is saying in these passages. Uh, we are going to be looking at, as you can see there on the board, uh, Nehemiah. When you go through the scriptures, there's different uh, themes, if you will, that are captured by the different characters or times or events or, or books or letters. And uh, I've always said that the book of Nehemiah is one of leadership. Whenever you want to teach leadership or study leadership, and these principles can be applied in your marriage, they can be applied, applied on your workplace, they can be applied uh, with your family and your children, they can be applied, obviously, within the church. But it's a wonderful, wonderful series of lessons that we can glean. And I just started scribbling and scribbling and scribbling, and I just kept going. And so I don't think we're going to finish this today, but we'll do our very best uh, to get started. How we got here, brother, and if we wanted to go back just for a quick, uh, a brief recap, this is part of, I guess we could call it a series on resurrection, on how we are rebuilding or how we are growing. We started back on what the world commonly knows as Easter. We don't refer to it as that. We refer to it as Resurrection Sunday. And we look at Christ rising from the dead, and we said, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55 through 58 is where we were on that particular uh, week. And then we started on this rebuilding uh, 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 series of lessons where we're looking at rebuilding. And so where, where we went first was in the book of Ezra. I'm sorry, in the book of Ezekiel, in the book of Ezekiel. We went to a lesson there, scraping by when your spirit is dry. Scraping by when your spirit is dry. And God began to speak with this, this man, this prophet, and it has to do with the time of Israel as they were uh, 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 in captivity or about to go into captivity. And God was speaking to him, and we learned about Jeremiah, who was the one that witnessed the captivity, but... <clears throat> We, we went to Ezra because he, I mean, uh, uh, we went to Ezekiel because he was at the river Shabar. He was in captivity, and God was sending him a series of messages. So we started there and looked at the dry bones and what that meant. And then we went over to Ezra, and we did a lesson in Ezra chapter number 6. The verse was number 10, and it was called This Ezra, because if you go through and start at chapter number 1, God begins to list all of the, the prophets and the people that were related to Ezra. And then he gets to uh, verse uh, 6, and he says, this Ezra, this guy right here, this is the one that I was preparing. This is the one that I was uh, working with. And we noticed that between uh, chapter 6 and chapter 7, there's about a 58-year gap. And in that 58-year gap, there was nothing that was going on that we could see, but God was preparing a man. And this man had a job and he had a mission, which leads right into where we were going. If you wanted to get a more detailed chronological look at this, I would suggest that you look at our lesson from last week. I don't, I don't want to go into that this week because we just don't have time. But when God restored the people, when he fulfilled this promise to Jeremiah, 
he first sent in the first wave of returnees was a man named Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel came back and his job was to rebuild the temple. His job was to rebuild the temple and to begin instituting programs to rebuild the people. So we looked at, at uh, different types of programs that we've had, national programs over the years from our government, our federal government. But those things were good, food step programs, welfare programs, the New Deal. All these things were good for the people, but they didn't do anything for the spirit. So God sent Ezra to teach people the laws and statutes of God himself. And so we looked at Ezra. And then after that, we took a break because we wanted to, to give our respect and our honor to our mothers. So we took a look at a lesson there. It was called Beautiful Child, a Beautiful Mother, a Beautiful God. This was the lesson on Yoshebed, who was the mother of Moses. And we looked at her plight. We looked at her situation and what she had to do to save what the Bible says was a beautiful child. And what she went through in the circumstances as a mother, and we wanted to apply that to all mothers, whether you're married or single, well, whoever you are, we didn't make any difference. We just wanted to give some props and encourage our mothers. And that kind of led us back into our uh, Let's Rebuild series where, we, where we're heading right now, going back into uh, Ezra. And we started by, I'm mean, sorry, Nehemiah. We started by looking at Nehemiah chapter number 1, verse 1 through 14. And we noticed how this man was a simple cupbearer. And we talked about the position of a cupbearer and how important that was because you were the one that held the goblet for the king. You were the one that gave him his whiskey, his bourbon, his scotch, his Hennessy, his whatever you want. He was a trusted person, someone that was in the presence of the king. And in fact, if the king was drunk and, and he started to spill his beans, you were the one that he usually talked to. We also talked about how important of a position this was because you were also the one that had to taste the wine. You had to make sure there was no poisoning in the king, uh, of the king. So this man that was a cupbearer was inside. But one day he had a heavy countenance. He had a heavy thought on his mind because of what was happening back in Jerusalem. But we compared that cupbearer to the cupbearer of our Lord Jesus Christ. And how why uh, Nehemiah may have been a cupbearer that had wine in it and all types of strong drink. But the cup that Jesus bore was full of sorrows and guilt and pain Amen. and sin. So we looked at the difference between Nehemiah's cup and the cup that Jesus Christ himself had carried for all of us. And so now we're on our lesson and we're going back into Looking at Nehemiah, and we're, we're progressing through because now Nehemiah, he, he, he went, and we, on the last lesson, the cupbearer, we noticed that he started with prayer. That was the thesis of the lesson. That was the heart of the lesson, the beginning of the lesson, is that no matter what we do for God, we always start with prayer. And uh, Nehemiah's prayer was that God would have grace on this man. And we saw that this man was none other than than the king. And so now we fast forward into chapter number four. If you look at chapter number three, no, chapter number two, excuse me, we'll, we'll kind of touch on a little bit today. It talks about how the, the interaction between Nehemiah and the king led to Nehemiah getting permission and actually him becoming the governor and him going back to survey Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. And then in chapter number three, it's literally a summary of the different families and all the tasks that they had to do in rebuilding the walls. Now, just for a little context, we want to understand that the, the king here that we're talking about, uh, Artaxerxes, uh, is the stepson of Esther in our Bibles. Esther is the queen now, and Artaxerxes is the stepson. Chronologically speaking, if you looked at the book of Esther, it would fit either in between Ezra and Nehemiah or just before Nehemiah. So you see the important role that Esther is playing, even though she's not mentioned in this book. Time frame now, we were about 160 years after the initial conquest of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. We noticed how uh, 
uh, uh, Nehemiah was in Shushan, the palace, and he spoke to his brother Hanani, who had been to Jerusalem. And Nehemiah was born in captivity, so he had never been to Jerusalem. He had never seen Jerusalem. But his heart was there. His heart was with the people. His heart was with the struggle that was happening there. We're also now about 91 years after the first captives return, because remember, the first captives returned by Zerubbabel. And then after that, the second wave came with Ezra. And so now we're coming to where this man, Nehemiah, this cupbearer, has a heavy heart, and he wants to go and help because uh, Zerubbabel rebuilt the nation. Uh, Ezra rebuilt the spiritual uh, uh, atmosphere, the spirituality of the people. And now Nehemiah is coming to get people to work together as one unit. If you went to Psalm Division 137, you would see a psalm of the people that were crying while they were in exile. Why is this important to us? Because some of us are still in exile. We're in an exile. We're in a state where we don't have fellowship with God or we're missing some things that could help our lives go a lot better. In Psalms 137, verse number one, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof, for there, that, for there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and that they wasted us required us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Verse 4, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? So the people had a great mourning to return to Jerusalem. So let's go now into Nehemiah chapter number four and begin to look at verse number one. But it came to pass that when Sambalot heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. Notice he's the ringleader. He's the hater in chief. He's the chief uh, stone thrower. He is the neighborhood antagonist. Anytime you want to do something for God, anytime you want to start getting your life together, any one time you want to start changing your old ways, your old habits, you ain't hanging out in the club no more. I know ain't is not a proper word, but y'all get what I'm saying. Whenever you don't want to hang out in the club anymore, whenever, whenever you don't have any, 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 any drugs on you anymore, then people are going to start acting different towards you. So we see Sambalat, and he spake before his brethren, and the army of Samaria, and said what? What do these feeble Jews, what do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heap of the rubbish which are burned? What are these feeble Jews going to do? What is this small little church on Palomar going to do? What is the brother or sister that is trying to put their marriage back together going to do? What are the people that are trying to live godly lives going to do? Verse number three, now Tobiah the, the Amorite was by him. This is the, the signer on, the hanger on, was by him and said, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. Verse number four. Hear, O God, we see Nehemiah praying again. Hear, O God, for we are despised, and turn their approach upon their own head, and give them for prey in the land of captivity. And cover not their iniquity, and let, the, let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So built we the wall, and the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. Brothers, underline that in your mind. For the people had a mind to work. But it came to pass that when Sambalot and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Astrodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, they were very wroth, or they were very angry, they were very uh, upset. Verse 8, and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. 
Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. And Judah said, let me get right, and Judah said, the strength of the bearers of the burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish. Make another mental note about how much trash there was. Much rubbish so that we are not able to build the wall. Verse number 11. And our adversaries said, and our adversaries said, they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. Verse 12. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us, how many times? Ten times. From all places which ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. Verse 13. Therefore set I in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. Verse 14. And, and I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. And fight for your brethren, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Make a note of what they were fighting for. Verse 15, and it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught or to nothing, that we returned all of us to the wall. How many? Every one unto his Work, verse 16. Amen. We get into the lesson, brethren. And it came to pass that from that time forth, from when? From that time forth, that the half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held both their spears, the shields, the bows, the haberdons, and the rulers were behind all of the house of Judah. Amen, somebody. Verse number 17. They which built it on the wall, and they that had bare burdens with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. For the builders, every one had his sword girded by his side, and so builded, and that the sound. And excuse me, and he that sounded the trumpet was where? He was by me. Amen, somebody. We're going to talk about him too. Verse 19. And I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, the work is great and large, and we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. In what place thereof ye heard the sound of the trumpet? You hear the sound of the trumpet. Resort ye back or return back unto us that, we, that our God shall fight for us. Verse number 21. So we labored in the work. And half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared at night. Likewise, at the same time, said I unto the people, let every one with his servant lodge within Jerusalem. We're going to come back to this, brethren, that in the night they may be a guard to us and labor on the day. Verse 23. So neither I nor my brethren nor my servants, nor the men of the guard which followed me, none of us put off our clothes, saving that every one put them off for washing. There is a whole lot in here, brethren. I don't think we're going to finish this one, Brother Mark. It's too much. Sometimes we got to slow down and understand what God is saying. Nehemiah 
was facing an insurmountable task. But he could not do it by himself. Even though in chapter 1, he had prayed to God, and we see that by we get to this time, God had granted his prayer, Brother Jimmy. He's not a cupbearer anymore. Imagine, Brother Dash, if you go to bed one night and you're a cupbearer, and the next morning, Brother Tony, you got your walking papers. Because even though he was a cupbearer, he was still a servant. Now, Brother Dave, not only does he have his walking papers, he's got letters to all the governors. He's got men to serve him. He's got money. He's got materials. He has everything that he needs to accomplish God's purpose except for the people. Why are you going there, Brother Williams? Because sometimes God will give you a job. God will give you a place to live. God will put $2 in your pocket. But you still are stuck in a situation where you're trying to lead your family. You're trying to lead a household. You're trying to deal with a situation when your man ain't around. You ain't got no husband to speak of. You don't have any uh, material possessions. You don't own the city. You're scraping by a uh, uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul. You got enough, uh, 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 enough food on Thanksgiving to throw something together. Your kids might be eating top ramen three nights of the week. Hey Amen, somebody. I know I'm only talking about myself because that's my story. Amen. But then... God is giving you a task. And he's blessing you with just enough to get it done. He's not coming down and building the walls for you. He's not grabbing folk by the neck and making it work with you. God is just giving you as the leader just enough to get by for that day. And it's up to us to slow down and see in this lesson, brother, that the very first thing that Nehemiah did was he prayed to God. And even during the midst of this project, he's praying to God. Even while Sambalot, the hater and the instigator, and Tobiah were coming at him, rallying up people against him. He prayed to God. This lesson, brethren, is so powerful for us because we see how Nehemiah, once again, was faced with an insurmountable task. Let's take a look into his little world for a second. He comes into Jerusalem in chapter number 2. He spends three days in Jerusalem in chapter number two, walking around. He didn't tell anybody what he was there for. He didn't tell them why they was there. He just walked around and surveyed the situation. I hope you all catching this because principle number one is you don't tell everybody your business. Amen. When you're working for God and you have things that you have to do, you and you working with God and you and God only. He walked around three days and three nights. He probably looked like a regular old bum walking around Jerusalem. And he went at night. And he surveyed the walls. In other words, he evaluated the problem. Sometimes, brother, we pray, but we also have to evaluate the problem in our life. What is hindering me from rebuilding the wall in my family? What is hindering me from rebuilding the wall in my business? What is hindering me from having my children or my spouse or my, 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 my friends and my relatives and my family members come back and support the work that we're trying to do? See, this is not a, just a spiritual application. This is a, a, a relevant application to your daily life and your family right now today. Amen. So he surveyed. 
We noticed that his task wasn't easy. Number one, he, he had to find food for the families and the workers. He had to manage the resources during the time of famine. He had to pre protect the workers from outside raids in neighboring countries. He had to defend the poor that were being exploited by money lawyers. We're going to get into that, Brother Tony, in chapter number five, and then we get into chapter number six and seven. We're going to talk about when they tried to assassinate him. But Leonidas' leadership in action is a master planner, an ex excellent delegator, and he had a servant's heart. But let's look first back at the instigation. In verse number one, but it came to pass, but when Sambalot heard that he would build the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. If you go back to chapter number two, if you go back to chapter number two, verse number 10, it says, when Sambalot the Horonite and Tobiah the, ser uh, the servant and the Ammonite heard of it, or heard of what? Heard of Nehemiah coming to do this work. It grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Hold up, brethren. As we said before, as soon as you start doing the work of the Lord, somebody's going to hate on you. Somebody's going to look at you and start talking about you and doubting you, and you'll say to yourself, okay, well, wait, maybe I'll just leave them alone. Why don't I just go over here and sit down in, in my corner, and I'll just do my work over here. Have y'all ever been in elementary school or junior high school? You know how children act? Even if you're quiet, you go sit over in the corner by yourself. It's just a matter of time before somebody looks at you. And why she got that bun on her head? Why he always wearing that same blue shirt? Why he always have to hold the pencil that way? People will come at you for the littlest and stupidest things because you are doing your work for the Lord. We see there they've had this instigation. And for you and I, brethren, there's two aspects of instigation. Number one, it will come from without. And number two, it could come from within. It can come from without because people that don't know you, that don't associate with you, they have no idea what your struggles is and what you've been through and what you're going through. They'll look at you and see that you're doing the work of the Lord, and they're going to start hating on you. And then when it comes from within, because it could be your own family. Sometimes in your own family, go out and get another car. <laughs> go out and get a better job. Go out and get a better apartment. Go out and buy some new furniture. All of a sudden, somebody in your family go pick up their little head and start talking about you. Instigation will come from without, and it will come from within. So the next aspect of this, brethren, it's contemplation. Let's go back and look at verse 9 through 10. The reason why we're, we're going through this, brother, is not that we're trying to capture everything, but we're just trying to sow some seeds so that you can have some spiritual understanding of how to navigate the issues in your life. Verse 9 and 10, contemplation. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. And Judah said, the strength of the bearers of the burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish so that we are not able to build the walls. Hold on, wait a minute. Sometimes you got to take the trash out. Sometimes there's folk in your life, they don't mean you no good. They come around to see what you're doing. They come around, they, they, they spy on you. Then some other times, there's some rubbish that might be in your life. Might be some old pain, some old hurt, some old issues that you haven't resolved in your life. And these things become hindrances for you to build your wall because all of a sudden, you're working at 100 miles an hour, but you're only progressing at 20 miles an hour. Because we have this stuff that's still built up in us. And the only way to get rid of that stuff is by coming back to, per coming back to, to worshiping the Lord, to getting your, your mind back to reading your Bibles, to praying diligently, to staying faithful to God, to trusting God. Even when you don't want to come to church, Lord have mercy, you come because you know that there's a blessing in there. It's not that you're going to get a check tonight. It's not that you're going to win the lotto tomorrow. It's not that you're going to get a promotion next week. The blessing comes because the spiritual uh, uh, upbringing that comes up on your life because you heard the word of the Lord. 
you turned off your television, excuse me, television for two hours. And you got more gasoline in two hours than all the hip hop songs, all the videos. Hey Amen. Watching TV make you dumb. Y'all didn't know that? Let me get back to this lesson. But going on, you realize that there was contemplation. We looked, and sometimes we have to take the trash out. Disintegration. Sometimes when you take the trash out, some other stuff starts falling down. Sometimes your little support mechanism starts to leave you. Sometimes when you dig the ditch, Brother Dave, other stuff fall in. You go back to chapter 2, verse 19. But when Sambalot the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Gershom the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn. They sat there and laughed at them and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? This was the other king. Verse 20, then answered I them and said unto them, the God of heaven will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. But ye have no portion, no right, no memorial in Jerusalem. What was he talking about? Because when the Babylonians came and conquered Jerusalem, y'all remember this. They didn't take everybody. They took the wealthy, they took the nobles, they took the bankers, they took the educators, they took all the brain power. But if you was poor, if you was a peasant, if you were a farmer, they left you there. Sambalot and Tobiah are related to the people that was already in Jerusalem. So when this, this, this Nehemiah comes back, Sambalot and Tobiah, they got status, Brother Dave. They got some position. So wait a minute, wait a minute. You're going to come and upset the apple cart. We run the Jews. We've been here. This is where that disintegration comes in. Because they saw Nehemiah coming. They saw what Nehemiah was trying to do. They saw that Nehemiah was trying to work for the Lord. And they laughed him to scorn. How many times? When you dedicate your life to God. When you change up your modus operandi, and some people look at you and say, why you still have faith? Yeah. Faith ain't put no food on your table. Faith ain't giving you a new job. They laugh you to scorn. And that's why we understand that faith without works is what? What is Nehemiah doing? <laughs> Nehemiah is working. He realized that his faith was going to carry him through, but he got up and did the work. So this disintegration, chapter 4, verse 11 to 12, and our adversary said, they that know neither see till we come into the midst of them and slay them. This is Sambalot and Tobias talking here, that till we slay them and cause this work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews dwelt there, uh, dwelt by them, came, they said to us, ten times from all the places when she were t which shall return to us, they will be upon you. In other words, no matter where you go in this city, we coming after you. Sometimes for the people nowadays, people don't front you, uh, confront you face to face. They, they kind of scurred. But they're sitting in the background, and they're the kind that, that Brother Pierce used to say, they'll throw their rock and hide the hand. They'll throw a rock at you and then hide the head. So no matter where you go in the city, they come in at you. So that was this disintegration. Now let's look at navigation. I guess I could have called it execution. But when it gets to the point of you being a leader in your life or in your family or whatever the situation is on your job, wherever you're at, there comes a point where the rubber has to meet the road, where you've prayed. You've been praying, you're still praying, but now there's some action that has to take place. If we go to verse 13, 
Nehemiah realizes, he surveyed. Therefore said I in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places. I even set the people after their families and with their swords, their spears, and their bows. Don't nobody run out of here and say, well, Brother Williams told me I need to go buy me a spear. I need to go buy me a bow. Our weapon, our bow, our spear is the sword of the spirit. It is the word of God. That sword of the spirit is both an offensive weapon and a defensive weapon. Number one, it will block all incoming things coming in. And number two, if Satan is sitting there, you can fight him off because it's an offensive weapon. Sometimes in the church, we always point to the elder. We always point to the deacon. We always point to the preacher. Amen, somebody. I ain't getting no amens on that. But the reason why I say that is because sometimes doing so absolves us from participating in the functions of the church. Because if we sit back and sit on our hands and say that that's so-and-so's job and that's so-and-so's job, then we never get involved. Obviously, God has a structure. He has a plan. We're not talking about deviating from God's structure. But we're talking about the 5% or 10% of the people that do 90% of the work. Amen. Amen, somebody. Don't preach that, Brother Williams. I'm trying to encourage. I'm trying to motivate. Because what you see in this lesson was every single person, every family, every child, everybody got involved. If you was an old person and you couldn't do anything, you carried water. If you was an older person and you couldn't uh, fight or climb up the wall, you were serving on the watch. If you were a young person with a strong back, you were running tools up and down the wall. If you was a middle-aged man that had some, 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 still some, some gas left in the tank, you had two swords. The point of the lesson here, brother, is, is everybody got involved. Hillary Clinton used to call it, 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 it takes a village. Now, I'm not trying to promote Hillary Clinton, Democrats, Republicans. I don't care about none of that stuff. But what we're talking about is the involvement of the family. Sometimes when we're struggling in our families and in our homes, it's because we're all operating like independent islands. Instead of slowing down sometimes and say, look, we have to have a family meeting. We have to have a family meeting. We're going to pray over this, but we're not going to complain behind one another's backs. Everybody gets the equal amount of time to say what's on their mind. We go around, we share it, we go around and we comment it, and go around again and we resolve it. But the only way for Nehemiah to build this wall was there had to be unity. And sometimes part of that unity means when you was taking out that trash a little bit earlier, you took pride and you threw it in that trash can. You took vengeance and you threw it in that trash can. You took anger, you threw it in that trash can. You threw a, a, a need for vengeance or justice and you threw it in that trash can. You took all the bad things that you still remember that's holding you back. Remember, you're still working, but you only, you, you're giving 100% of the effort, but only 20% of the results are coming out. Why? Because we still got trash that we hanging on to. This navigation, Nehemiah spent three days, remember, observing observing what was going on there in the city. The next one leads right into a communication. If you go back to chapter 2, you look at verse number 11, Nehemiah says, Then said I unto them, You see the distress that we are in. Amen, somebody. You see the situation. I'm tired of living check to check. I'm tired of eating top ramen. 
I'm tired of having to go over my mama's house for this and that. I'm tired of having to scrape together enough money to feed these babies. I'm tired of always coming home to fights and arguments. Nehemiah says, you see the distress that we are in. How Jerusalem way laced, uh, uh, excuse me, layeth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Somebody's family, somebody's heart, somebody's world, somebody's dreams are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. In other words, he prayed, he surveyed, and he acted. There's a time in our life, brethren, where we have to turn off that TV because that TV will have you wishing forever. That's Ice Cube, if y'all don't remember. That TV will have you wishing you was a hip-hop star. That TV will have you wishing you was a billionaire on a yacht. That TV will have you wishing that you had this and that. Sometimes it's time to turn off that television and get to work. Get to work on your life. Get to work on your goals. Get to work on your dreams. And oh, yes, get to work in the Lord's house. Now we come back to chapter 4 and look at verse 14. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, he's communicating, be ye not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives. Fight for your houses. Sometimes, brethren, the, the saddest commentary in the church today is that you don't have to fight for nothing. We think that God is just going to come down and zap all your enemies. You think he's going to snap his finger and rebuild the walls for you? He's giving you what you need. Sometimes in faith, you have to stand up and fight for the things that you love. No, you can't have my daughter. No, you can't have my son. No, you can't do this to me. Sometimes, brethren, this is all surrounding or all involving the concept of godly leadership. And you don't get this stuff by staying away. You get it by coming and hearing the word of the Lord. Some things are worth fighting for, brethren. In verse 14, to me, I almost could have spent a whole lesson right there fighting for your brethren, for your sons, and your daughters, and your wives, and your whole house. You go on now, and you look at the next concept is coordination. We don't do random. You don't throw slop at the wall expecting it to become a Picasso. There's some coordination involved. Verse 17 and 18, they which build it on the wall and they that bear burdens were those that laid it, everyone with one another's hands wrought in the work and with the other hand held a weapon. For the builders, everyone had his sword girded by his side and so built it and he that sounded the trumpet was by me. The trumpet in Israel is called a shofar. It's literally a ram's horn. And the shofar was usually sounded to uh, announce marches, to announce a president, to announce a king. Then there were certain staccato blasts, one blast, two blasts, three blasts. That would indicate when they were in battle, whether they would attack, whether they would hold, or whether they would retreat. What are you saying, Brother Williams? Nehemiah got the trumpet bearer. He said, you stay with me. You stay with me. The lesson here is there's always somebody in your corner. Amen, somebody. There's always somebody that's your trumpet bearer. It might be grandma. Amen, somebody. It might be Uncle Johnny. 
It might be nephew. It might be somebody that you don't even talk to all the time. But when you're going through your struggle, you're trying to rebuild your wall and your life and your family, recognize your trumpet bearer. And that's the person that you reach out to. They don't want nothing. They're not laughing you to scorn. They're not putting you on blast. They're not getting information and running back and telling the enemy. They're sitting right there by your side. Nehemiah's leadership instinct through God was to say, you stay right here with me. I don't know who your trumpet bearer is, but survey your landscape. Survey your situation. Spend your three days walking around your Jerusalem and looking at the walls of your life and find your trumpet bearer. We go on now as we begin to land this plane, brethren. I want to go and look now at just a couple of more concepts. I think what I'll do is probably just summarize these. We're going to look at inspiration, and then we're going to look at obligation, and then we're going to look at incorporation. Inspiration, verse number 19 and 20. And I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, the work is great and large, and we are separated upon the wall one far from another. In what place therefore ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye here unto us, our God shall fight for us. In other words, sometimes you need someone that's going to hear your call, someone in your life that is, again, just like your trumpet bearer, that's not going to judge you, not going to uh, come at you, but they are going to inspire you. The next one was obligation, verse number 21. Uh, so we labored in the work. And half of them held their spears from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared. In other words, brethren, you have to have some consistency. You have to have what they call stick to itness. You can't be working on Monday and then taking off Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then praying to God and then working again on Saturday. Your battles sometimes take a full court press. Sometimes you got to stay on your job, and that means staying in your your, your spiritual walk with God. This is your uh, obligation. And then your incorporation. Verse 22. Likewise, we at the same time said, I unto the people, let every one with his servant lodge within Jerusalem. In other words, divided we fall, uh, divided we uh, are conquered, as long as people are scattered around and not buying into the program and not working together, then we are not going to be successful. That doesn't mean you won't have individual success. That doesn't mean that God won't bless you in certain ways. Ways, but there is strength in numbers. So Nehemiah recognized to have the people live within the walls, live within uh, the walls of Jerusalem or live within the proper of the city because he knew that incorporating them would make them stronger. And then last but not least is continuation. Verse 23, so neither I nor my brethren nor my servants nor the men of the guard which followed me, none of us put off our clothes saving that everyone put them off for washing. In other words, they were consistent. In other words, they stuck with the plan. In other words, as we go back up and earlier in the text, it said the people had a mind to work. This is just part of the lessons that we learn from this great man, Nehemiah. But we have another great man that had a different mission. He had a different wall to build. In some respect, he tore down walls, Lord have mercy. That's none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so while we look upon Nehemiah and how we see the principles that help us and that bring us together so that we can serve God's purpose here on earth, Jesus had a different purpose. His purpose was to free you from sin and bondage and, and laboring. It was to give you that rest. And what are you talking about rest, Brother Williams? I still got to get up and go to work in the morning. No, we're talking about that rest from that spiritual agony, from the guilt, from the pain, from the memories, from all the things that weigh you down and gum you up and stop you from achieving your purpose. When you have Christ Jesus in your life, all those things just kind of run off the left side and the right side because you have a, a purpose. You have a spirit. You have a heart for God. You have some direction for God. God. And this is the things that Jesus came to do. Not only that, but to 
uh, be that propitiation through his blood for our sins. And if you're not in the body of Christ, I would encourage you to hear that gospel message, that death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I would encourage you also to believe that gospel message, that method, message that, that lets us know why he came and suffered and bled and died. And then I would encourage you to repent of your sins. Repent in Hebrew is teshuva, which, which simply means a turning away. And I would encourage you to be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. I would encourage you to confess Jesus Christ as the only name given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. And I would encourage you to live faithful unto death. If this is you, you have not given your life over to Christ Jesus, please stand as we sing the song of invitation. from the fold of God hear you now the invitation oh prepare to me thy God careless soul oh heed the warning for your life will soon be gone 